It's interesting to read a Soviet dissident describe the slow process of dehumanization. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn in volume one of the Gulag Archipelago, he has this two page passage. I'm gonna read the whole thing. It's actually more like three pages. Um, where he talks about how a certain class of people known as the Kulaks were through a slow process of dehumanization and uh, propaganda um, or by means of propaganda were made to be seen by society and by the government as a nuisance to be got rid of. I find this passage to be so incredibly relevant to today concerning the way certain political factions in this country characterize other political factions and the people that exist in them. I will explain further what I mean by this after I read the passage, so without further ado, let's read the passage. And so the waves foamed and rolled, but over them all, in 1929 and 1930, billowed and gushed the multi-million wave of dispossessed kulaks. It was immeasurably large, and it could certainly not have been housed in even the highly developed network of Soviet interrogation prisons which in any case were packed full by the gold wave. Instead, it bypassed the prisons, going directly to the transit prisons and camps, onto prisoner transports, into the Gulag country. In sheer size, this non-recurring tidal wave, it was an ocean, swelled beyond the bounds of anything the penal system of even an immense state can permit itself. There was nothing to be compared with it in all Russian history. It was the forced resettlement of a whole people, an ethnic catastrophe. But yet, so cleverly were the channels of the GPU gulag organized that the cities would have noticed nothing had they not been stricken by a strange three-year famine, a famine that came about without drought and without war. This wave was also distinct from all those which preceded it because no one fussed about with taking the head of the family first and then working out what to do with the rest of the family. On the contrary, in this wave, they burned out whole nests, whole families from the start, and they watched jealously, jealously to be sure that none of the children, 14, 10, even six years old, got away. To the last scrapings, all had to go down the same road to the same common destruction. This was the first such experiment, at least in modern history. It was subsequently repeated by Hitler with the Jews, and again by Stalin with nationalities which were disloyal to him or suspected by him. This wave included only pathetically few of those kulaks for whom it was named, in order to draw the wool over people's eyes. In Russian, a kulak is a miserly, dishonest, rural trader who grows rich not by his own labor, but through someone else's, through usury and operating as a middleman. In every locality, even before the revolution, such kulaks could be numbered on one's fingers. And the revolution totally destroyed their basis of activity. Subsequently, after 1917, by a transfer of meaning, the name kulak began to be applied in official and propaganda literature, whence it moved into general usage, to all those who in any way hired workers, even if it was only when they were temporarily short of working hands in their own families. But we must keep in mind that after the revolution, it was impossible to pay less than a fair wage for all such labor. The committees of the poor and the village Soviets looked after the interests of landless laborers. Just let somebody try to swindle a landless laborer. To this very day, in fact, the hiring of labor at a fair wage is permitted in the Soviet Union. But the inflation of this scathing term, kulak, proceeded relentlessly. And by 1930, all strong peasants in general were being so called. All peasants strong in management, strong in work, or even strong merely in convictions. The term kulak was used to smash the strength of the peasantry. Let us remember, let us open our eyes. Only a dozen years had passed since the great decree on the land. That very decree, without which the peasants would have refused to follow the Bolsheviks, and without which the October Revolution would have failed. The land was allocated in, in accordance with the number of mouths per family, equally. It had been only nine years since the men of the peasantry had returned from the Red Army and rushed onto the land they had wrested for themselves. Then suddenly, there were kulaks and there were poor peasants. How could that be? Sometimes it was the result of differences in initial stock and equipment. Sometimes it may have resulted from luck in the mixture of the family. But wasn't it most often a matter of hard work and persistence? And now these peasants, 
whose bread grain had fed Russia in 1928, were hastily uprooted by local good-for-nothings and city people sent in from outside. Like raging beasts, abandoning every concept of humanity, abandoning all humane principles which had evolved through the millennia, they began to round up the very best farmers and their families, and to drive them, stripped of their possessions, naked into the northern wastes, into the tundra and the taiga. Such a mass movement could not help but develop subsequent ramifications. It became necessary to rid the villages also of those peasants who had merely manifested an aversion to joining the collective farms, or an absence of inclination for the collective life, which they had never seen with their own eyes, about which they knew nothing, and which they suspected, we now know how well-founded their suspicions were, would mean a life of forced labor and famine under the leadership of loafers. Then it was also necessary to get rid of those peasants, some of them not at all prosperous, who, because of their daring, their physical strength, their determination, their outspokenness in meetings, and their love of justice, were favorites with their fellow villagers and by virtue of their independence were therefore dangerous to the leadership of the collective farm. Beyond this, in every village, there were people who in one way or another had personally gotten in the way of the local activists. This was the perfect time to settle accounts with them of jealousy, envy, insult. A new word was needed for all these victims as a class, and it was born. By this time, it had no social or economic content whatsoever, but it had a marvelous sound. Pod Kulachnik, a person aiding the Kulaks. In other words, I consider you an accomplice of the enemy, and that finishes you. The most tattered landless laborer in the countryside could quite easily be labeled a podkuranik. And so it was that these two terms embraced everything that constituted the essence of the village, its energy, its keenness of wit, its love of hard work, its resistance, and its conscience. They were torn up by the roots, and collectivization was accomplished. So the reason I read that passage and the reason I think it is so relevant to today's, you know, political fanaticism is if you notice the term kulak changed meaning to encompass way more people than the actual definition of the term would ordinarily, um, you know, encompass, uh, you know, initially it meant, you know, just kind of like a greedy person who profits off of the labor of other people. Um, and Solzhenitsyn talked about how there was not really that many people that even did that back then. There was a very small handful. But the Soviets, they needed an excuse for arrest, and they needed to kind of destroy the whole Kulak culture, the whole political ca class of you know independent farmers and people who just wanted to live their own life apart from the collectivized state. And so they expanded the term Kulak. And it began to take on, you know, just even just regular people who didn't, weren't just, they just weren't the biggest fan of this communist idea of the way to run a farm. And th this term kulak got so big and it encompassed so many people that its initial meaning didn't mean any, no longer applied. And then what was so fascinating in this passage is it talked about how then that wasn't even enough. No, they needed to come up with a term, you know, uh, they said pod kulanik. I can't really pronounce that uh, very well, but the Soviets had to come up with a new term and so, so that they could arrest more people who were associated with the kulaks. Um, and this was all, of course, in, in an effort to, uh, you know, dismantle the whole bourgeoisie, uh, you know, structure in, in Russia. Um, and it ended with a famine, as Solzhenitsyn said, that uh, was not caused by drought or war. Um, it was just an evil, evil famine. And it's fascinating, you, you, you know, uh, where you read later in the book how, you know, the Soviets then put people on trial and blamed them for the famine, when in reality it was uh, the Soviets that caused the famine in the first place. I think that this, you know, expansion of the meaning of terms you know, this changing of definitions uh, is something that's taking place right now in America. Bear with me here, but the term white supremacist is, I think, very similar to the term kulak in that, truth be told, there's a very, very, very small amount of actual true white supremacist. I've never met a KKK member in my life. Of the people that I've met who have said racist things, 
It's a very small handful, and none of them would identify as white supremacists. This is my entire life, and I live in Oklahoma, the reddest state in the country, okay? And yet, all day long, we hear on CNN, MSNBC, you know, the New York Times, talking about how, you know, basically white supremacy is behind every corner. Um, and how white supremacists are, you know, up to something. Um, of course, they are, they are up to something, but the number is, like I said, so, 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 so small. And yet, our media talks about white supremacists all the time. And my theory, and I think this is, I think this is a fair thing to say, my theory is that the term white supremacist has been hijacked by a bunch of propaganda artists who they want to, instead of like meeting the arguments of say people on the political right who are more conservative, they just want to label them as white supremacists. They expand the term of white supremacist to mean anyone who is remotely conservative. Again, I think this is a fair observation. Like, it seems to me, like, the left is very content to flippantly call, you know, people who voted for Trump white supremacists or Nazis. When, I'm sorry, the, just the data is not there to support that half of the country are a bunch of white supremacists and Nazis. It's a good way to, uh, you know, chill the speech of conservatives. Um, because they're afraid that they might be called a white supremacist. Now, am I saying that this is going to end in a genocide of people that are Republicans or are conservatives or, you know, right-wing libertarians? No, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that um, that same propagandistic tactic used by the uh, leftist Soviets is being used by the leftist Americans of taking a term that describes a very, very small group of people and using that term in a very disingenuous and dishonest way to malign a whole bunch of people that are completely innocent of white supremacy. I think it is incumbent upon all of us to commit to stop this bullshit. Um, so if you're on the left and, uh, you know, you disagree with conservatives, maybe you even just hate them, don't stoop to the level of calling people white supremacist Nazis unless they actually are that, unless you actually have evidence of that. And similarly, if you're on the right, don't stoop so low uh, as to call everyone on the left a communist. <laughs> it's not okay to malign entire groups of people based on very, very small minorities of actually bad people. So let's stop this nonsense, people.